Hi, everyone. This is The Taste of Dawn. I'm your host, Dawn Garcia, and this is a show about indulging in this crazy thing we call life. Hi, you guys. So welcome to a very, 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 very special um, episode of today's show. Um, I'm actually doing something completely different today, and I am talking to a writer, an Oscar-winning writer and director and acclaimed author and war correspondent, Sebastian Younger, who's going to be on the line in just a few minutes. And I'm spending the entire hour talking to him about everything related to his latest film about uh, Tim Hetherington, who is an absolute astounding journalist who was killed in action um, or in on the front lines, I guess, in Libya. Um, and he was killed almost two years ago in April. And he, the the relationship between them when they made the movie Restrepo really just struck a chord with me and I I had the opportunity to meet them both two years ago and um, I'm just I'm absolutely excited really to have him on he's he's just one of those people in life that you come across that just strikes something so deep in you for the work that he's done Um, you know he puts his life on the line on a regular basis and uh, the story that he tells is just genuinely heartfelt and passionate and he's really someone that deserves everyone's respect and also I think it's important to raise awareness on all the things that are happening to journalists in the field right now um and we're going to talk about war and politics and everything that I've never talked about before so (laughs) this is kind of a big one today so I just want to um start is he on the line yet Alan yes okay so we're going to go ahead and, and get Sebastian on right now but um, I just want to say thank you so much for tuning in and um, keep your mind open today. And if you have any questions at all, he is an acclaimed writer and author and journalist. And like I said, he's he's won the Oscar for Restrepo along with Tim Hetherington. But his latest film, Which Way From Here to the Front Lines, The Life and Times of Tim Hetherington, is a movie that's going to be released via HBO on April 18th. And we are just going to be discussing some of the details of that movie and... Um, just everything that that entails so anyways we've got him on the line now so hello hi there hi thank you so much for being on the show today and i'm I'm just really looking forward to our discussion (laughs) yeah well well, me too thank you yeah so i wanted to start a little bit just by some people may not know all the things that you've done and worked on um and i'd like to just go ahead and start with the latest project, which is uh, Which Way From Here to the Front Lines, uh, the, li- the Life and Time of Tim Hetherington. And I know it was just, um, it was the official selection of the 13th Sundance Film Festival. And I did get to see some of the footage with you guys sitting down on the carpet for the Sundance channel. And um, if you want to just kind of talk a little bit about how that film came about, and I know you probably talked to death about it, but um, it's fascinating. Yeah, well, um a few years ago, um, I made a film called Restrepo with my colleague Tim Hetherington mm-hmm. uh, at an outpost in Afghanistan, and it was our first documentary, and we went all the way to the Oscars with it. And a few weeks later, uh, we were supposed to go on assignment to Libya to cover the Civil War. At the last minute, I had to cancel my plans, and Tim went on his own, and he was killed on April 20, uh, two, almost two years uh, ago mm-hmm. by a mortar round in the city of Misrata and I decided to make a film about um, what happened to him uh, he was shooting video the whole time that he was in combat on his last day wow. and uh, he also had an extraordinary life and an incredible body of work and so I just decided to make a film about my good friends and and who's an amazing photographer and and filmmaker yeah, and I had the first time I actually met both of you. Thankfully, was um, at the foreign film or the documentary symposium at the Academy Foundation, and um, I will never forget. I mean, I'm somebody who I knew a lot about what had happened in Rwanda. I knew there there's so many civil conflicts around the world, but Afghanistan was sort of this untouched. I think people just did not know that much. You know, I, we had such misinformed media, really, and um, and so when I started watching the clip I think it was like a two minute clip I don't even think we got more than two minutes and it was the first wasn't it the first week you guys were there you were hit right Is yeah it- yeah well we um, it actually I mean the sort of timing of it was complicated I started the project in June of 07 okay. and um, and then Tim came on board in September and started shooting video in October of 07 
we each did five one month trips and we were there together sometimes and alone sometimes but basically every time we were there there was an enormous amount of combat the, the unit we were with it was a, a platoon of 30 men uh, and that platoon was partly stationed at an outpost with 20 men so 20 of the 30 men were at Restrepo this outpost on this knife edged ridge very very rough conditions and they were they were in something like 300 400 firefights in there during their deployment so we were in the middle of all that and uh so yeah we were we were hit pretty quickly whenever we went out there yeah just remember like as soon as it was hit i mean i think everybody in the audience jumped because that was that was like okay this is no longer we're not just watching some guys on screen we're actually i think that was really one of the most impacting moments for me in film really especially yeah. in documentaries because it was very raw there was no no fancy lighting no it was not completely unplanned you know in um yeah. and i think really that's kind of what raised my awareness i mean and, and i spoke to you yesterday about you know i have friends that have been there and just the things that these soldiers are experiencing and and for you guys to go in there for so long because it was almost a, a full year that you were there on and off right yeah, we each did five one-month trips, so we oh, covered right, a lot of territory. Okay. Uh, we covered a lot of that deployment, um, but no, if, you... you know, if I if I could have if I could go back and do it again, I think I would would have wanted to be there about twice as much. But we did as much as we could. Right, and now, how were you guys received by the troops? Really, because that's a very personal space. Yeah, well, you know, the the soldiers are. Um, skeptical of the media and for some good reasons yeah. actually sometimes Absolutely. And when you first get out to a place like that um, it's so raw and it's so on the edge and everything is so important and the stakes are enormous and it's a little bit like being like your first day at, at a new school like you <laughs> kind of don't know where to sit in the cafeteria almost like, I mean <laughs> right. there wasn't a cafeteria out there but you know what I'm saying like, I do, yeah. you just sort of don't know what to do with yourself but, you know, trip after trip and firefight after firefight, patrol after patrol, they they got to trust us and got to like us. And by the end of the year, we were incredibly close with them. And they were very, very emotionally open and honest and really allowed us to do our work, which was, as we saw it, uh, not to understand the overall war, but to get a sense of what it feels like to be a soldier at a small outpost in combat. And... Um and I know, like, I got to see some of the clips, and we'll show some of the clips in just a minute from the film. Uh, but there's one, and I'm not sure where it is. It looks like, it, I don't know if it's in the Sudan, some of the, the pictures of Tim's work in, um, where there's just bodies on the floor, you know, laying on the ground. Some of them look like they've yeah. been... There's a Darfur. There's a Darfur. There's a Darfur, yeah. And I, I um, not to retract, I just think the one thing I have to say from a writing perspective is the the psychology of seeing really the repercussions of war through the lens that you guys showed us was something I don't I don't know that anybody had ever really seen anything like that because it was very honest it was completely unbiased you know it was just here here it is here's what's happening and um I think I would love to kind of get your input on I mean we again we kind of touched on this a little bit yesterday but but seeing that firsthand and then knowing what these guys come back to after having seen so much battle, yeah. so much combat, so much like, I mean, it's, it's, and it was, it, they never had rest, really. I mean, and I know it's not getting any better, really, as much as we, I, I know that they're bringing troops home, which is great, but there's still, it's almost at such a rapid pace. There's no, um, there's no, there's no real ease in the transition, you know, and yeah, I, I, yeah, that's hard. It's very fast. I mean, World War Two, the, the men were put on troop ships and brought home you know, over the course of several months. Right. They were allowed to decompress. Um, one of the hardest things is, um, I mean, it's interesting, a lot of the guys that I was with out there will talk about their time at Restrepo was one of the best times in their lives. <laughs> and so what makes coming back from war so hard is that a lot of the soldiers uh, find themselves missing it. And not missing the killing, I mean, they're not psychopaths. Right, no, the camaraderie is the closeness, like the connection that they had. And yep. they, they can't duplicate that back home, and they really miss it, and it leaves them feeling quite lost. One of the gentlemen here that I work with, he was in Desert Storm, and he was telling me that when, you know, even then, it's so much different than it is now. 
Um, but, you know, when he came back, he would go to the VA hospital and just, you know, try and get, he needed help when he got back. And, and the stigma too attached to that for these guys that really need help. And then the ones that really wanted and getting approved, you know, yeah. they have this, they, they just get like, they're in war one day and then back home the next. And, yeah. and, and then, you know, the family, this, he was telling me this, that, um, you know, the family tries so hard. They want to understand so deeply so much, but it's not possible unless you've been there and it's just frustrating I think yeah. sometimes for these guys and then not having you know not being able yep. to have access to what they need because they have to go through this process of getting approved and get their claims approved and all this stuff and it's just this long sort of this awfully daunting process and I feel like they don't get a chance to decompress well, one soldier I'm particularly close to um, made the very good point that the worse off you are the worse your PTSD is the less emotionally capable you are of dealing with an impenetrable bureaucracy like the VA. Right. And so what that means is that it's actually the guys who are doing better that get more. And the guys who are really badly off just can't deal with that bureaucracy, and it's an awful bureaucracy. It really truly is. I mean, it's awful. Oh, right. Our system and, is incredibly flawed, I think, especially when it comes to the military. Yeah, and so the guys who really need help are the ones who just cannot get for work and cannot deal with the waiting and cannot deal with the conflicts and the problems in that bureaucracy. They wind up because they're just not together enough to, to get through that process. I mean, it's like the DV times a thousand. You know, I mean, it's just, <laughs> just it's so much worse. It's just awful. Well, no, and I just think, you know, and they seem less, I mean, I know there's no way to prepare. But I feel like these guys are so young, so young in so many ways because of all the things that everything's so quick in society. You know, there's not that maturity. And then they go yeah. and then they're given guns and they're going off to do things that they feel is honorable. You know, some of them, at least most of them, I think. And then they get there and it's just a completely different situation. Yeah. You know? Oh, you know what, Sebastian, yeah. we have to take a quick break. Okay. Okay. So just hang on for one second. Thanks for tuning in. Once again, this is your host, Don Garcia, on A Todd Radio, savoring life one moment at a time. Hi, I'm Aaron Michael Sanchez. And I'm Kelly B. Dolan. And you can listen to us every Thursday at 2 p.m right here on KCAA Radio. What do we talk about, Kelly? We talk about everything from entertainment to business and tech, and we have a few laughs in between. And we <laughs> dance a whole lot. In fact, if you want to watch us every day, you can go to AaronandKellyLive.com. That's AaronandKellyLive.com. Check it out. This is Anthony Sykes, your host for Sykes Accounting and Consulting Radio Show, where we help small businesses grow and give you tax tips every Tuesday from 6 to 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Catch us here on RantRadioNetwork.com. Thank you. We are the three guys every Monday live from 6 to 7 p.m. You can call us at 855-69-THE-THREE-GUYS. <laughs> it's not the three guys. This is why you should turn in because one has Tourette's. The you other really, one's illiterate. You really should listen in. You never know what's going to happen. 855-69-THREE-GUYS. G-U-Y-S and the number three, not the. Faces yeah. for radio, voices for the deaf. Look forward to talking to you. Hey, I'm audio candy. I don't know about what you guys <laughs> This segment has been brought to you by Coco Cafe. It's a cafe latte coconut water with espresso. And I came across this wonderful little drink just recently. And it has to be one of the best things I've ever had. I'm pretty obsessed with cocoa water and espresso. So the thought of it together was a little bit, I'm not, I wasn't sure what I was going to get. But my gosh, let me tell you, it's super tasty. It's made with natural coconut water, a strong shot of espresso, and a splash of reduced fat milk. You can visit them online for more information at drinkcococafe.com. Once again, I want to thank everyone at Coco Cafe for being a sponsor of this radio show. Thanks so much. 
Hi, everyone. This is The Taste of Dawn. I'm your host, Dawn Garcia, and this is a show about indulging in this crazy thing we call life. Sebastian. All right, you guys, we're back, and I'm so sorry. If Sebastian, if you can hear me, we're actually going to figure out how we can talk during the break. <laughs> okay. Something happened All with right. the... I'm not sure what happened there. So, um, okay. Okay, so we can pick up where we, where we left off here. Um, I would love to actually... I, we talked about this again yesterday a little bit, but we can. I just want to hear kind of your input on really the the political situation and how that affects these guys that are going to war. Because I mean, you're. I mean, you really are a true war correspondent, and you you have seen so much. And um, and I think your take would be very different probably than somebody who's in office. And um, yeah, so I would just. I'm very curious to see kind of from your. Like, are there things that you think have just gotten worse? Has anything improved? You mean the the political situation in Afghanistan or in the United no, States? No, with, with our soldiers, in terms of how politics yeah. have influenced really what's happening to some of these guys. And then, and then we could definitely talk about the political situation. Um, well, you have to understand about soldiers is that they're very narrowly focused, as they should be. Um, they're, fo- they're told what their mission is. Mm-hmm. And whatever that may be, um, it might be build a school, it might be deliver food to a village, it might be clear a valley, clear out a valley of insurgents, you know, whatever it is, they're given their mission, and they're 100% focused on that mission. And if all the units complete all their missions successfully, the war is going pretty well, but they really don't think about the broader strategy, the, the broader political issues, uh, for that matter, even the broader moral issues, they really don't. Um, they are they're 19 year olds on the ground doing something very demanding and very very precise and so they, they just they really just don't talk about it I think in Vietnam they probably did because many of them were drafted and so the politics of the war was one of the reasons that they were in the war but all the guys that I was with every single person in the US military for one reason or another chose to join wanted to be a soldier chose to join they 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 really don't sort of second guess the rationale for the war, right? And then they come home. <laughs> and they come home. Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say too. Um, I think that things are so different in that you know how you were mentioning how close these guys are in that there's a bond that is so. And I I know everyone in previous wars, you know, the bond they always say is so it's just so incredibly unbreakable. But now these guys actually train together before they're deployed. So they're they're together from the very beginning. So when something happens to one of them in the field, I feel like the, the emotional repercussions, the hard loss is even more deeply felt. Versus Yeah, I mean, it really is a kind of family. And some of these guys aren't from the greatest families originally. And so right. the, the family of the platoon is actually becomes incredibly important. And one of them said to me, uh, he said, you know, there's guys in the platoon who straight up hate each other, but we would all die for each other. Right, which is... And, which, which is quite similar to family. I mean, you know, in family... You, <laughs> yeah, we, family, don't, we don't always get, choose. <laughs> you get a lot of strong emotions going on, you know, but, but, but you're family, and that's, that's very much how a platoon works, and it's absolutely crucial in combat that you can completely count on every other guy there, regardless of how pissed off you were at him yesterday or vice versa you really can't think about that in combat right so now when you guys are there and you're doing your job are you how do like if something were to happen i mean i know you're definitely in terms of military you're going to be last on the list to be looked at but this is kind of what leads me obviously to risk as well as um you know when you're out there and you're seeing all these things and you do become so close to them, what, like, if you were to get shot at and you were, something were to happen, are they looking out for you while you're there? And oh. I don't even mean in, like, what you guys did in Restrepo. I just mean in general when you're out in the field. I mean, how how does that just sort of independent of them on your own doing if, your job? If, if, if you're with the U.S. military in, uh, on a combat operation, they are completely responsible for you oh, the okay. way they are responsible for all for each other. Okay. And and if you get shot, the medic will come help you if he's alive, if he's capable of it. He mm-hmm. will come help you, and they'll get you on a medevac, and they'll get you out of there. And they'll fly you to Germany and patch you up, or whatever it may be. And so Tim uh, broke 
broke his leg in combat on top of the Avascar Mountain oh, at great. about 9,000 feet, and uh, they couldn't get him out by helicopter, and he walked all night on a broken leg. Um, mm. and there, there was a lot of combat. It was a very bad situation. He walked all night on a broken leg, and they, he got down to the town of Lendigal, and they pulled him out by helicopter. Wow. Um, and and they, then they put a plate in his leg, uh, at Bagram Air Base at the medical facilities there they put a plate in his leg they took care of him and then you had an injury on one of your first assignments right? yeah on my second trip there the first time I was with Tim uh, I ruptured my Achilles tendon on a uh, on a patrol uh, I was carrying a lot of weight and we were moving all our gear out to Restrepo and uh, I just I had most of the gear too. I had a, my pack was bigger than Tim's and uh, so I had a lot of gear and I ruptured my Achilles and I was pretty impaired for about a week. I mean, I I could move, but I, I, with a lot of difficulty. And Ugh, so I got through that trip. It was a few weeks out there. I got through that trip, and I went home to do physical therapy and sort of put myself back together. And then Tim took the next trip. That's when he broke his leg. Then I took the next trip. While he was healing, I took the next trip, and I, I got blown up in a Humvee. <laughs> and then he took the next one. We just kept on. <laughs> you just kept trading, <laughs> trading yeah. injuries and stories. Um, and so in this film, and you're really exploring, again, I think, just the the body of work that Tim was responsible for. And the one thing I have to say that makes, to me, what makes you guys stand out so much is um, it's really outside of politics. The way, I mean, his his passion was definitely for people, and it seems your passion is the same. And it's not just soldiers, it's the people that are... That are um, yeah. impaired by war wherever they are the civilians the families the loss that of course the accidents that happen that, you know all, all of these things that are sort of repercussions of war and i just I, I i i just think that's amazing but the fact that you can tell the story so beautifully and tim you know there's a scene um and maybe we can show that clip uh the, there's a scene with him talking and i don't know where i, I think he's in it looks like he's in india um where he's talking to that little girl. He's in just Sri Lanka, t- yes. In Sri Lanka, right. yeah, and he's taking the picture, and it's just, it, it's that very human, straight away, any pretense, any of the BS, any of the politics, any of this sort of Western mentality that I think, unfortunately, is usually well assigned. Um, and, it, like, that just seems to be what, like, that's the man that I met. You know, yeah. so the film that you that you put together, I think, does a really brilliant job of showing that. But I, we're going to just show a quick clip, actually. Okay. Right. Wow, she's a really bright character. Huh? How old? How old are you? Nine years old. Nine years old. Well, what's her favorite time at school? You seem very intelligent for nine, huh? Just keep looking here and don't move. It's necessary, I think, in raising a sort of consciousness of, of serious political or, or social events to create something that works on a more imaginative level. Something that will allow the viewer to engage creatively with the subject. Can you see me? Hello, Prasad. <laughs> okay, we're going to swap now, and you're going to come and sit here. For me, it's all about personalization. Yeah. You know, often we see scenes of disaster and, and it's almost like we forget that the people imaged are individuals with individual stories and lives. Yeah? You don't? Okay, no problem. Ask him, was that painful? Um, and I think that's very... I, I think that it, that's sort of the problem sometimes is that people, we've lost sight of who we are as individuals and people collectively because of all this conflict that's happening around the world. And to, to tap into something that's very innocent and real is, is yeah. I mean, that seems to be what I hope every journalist is striving to find, that sort of commonality between us rather than this massive divide that we're just fed, you know? Well, you know, under the job of journalism, there's a lot of different specialties. And um, there are journalists who focus on understand the very understanding the very very complicated volatile political sort of matrix that we're all in in mm-hmm. the world 
and it's an important job. But that's very different from trying to do what Tim was doing in that scene, which was really, really connecting to the experience of, you know, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds in Sri Lanka. And, you know, Tim was very, very curious about the world. He had a tremendous humanity about him. Uh, he was very, very open. He really engaged people as equals, no matter how poor they were, or for that matter, how young they were. And it really made people love him and opened up to him. And as a result, he would gain access to some very personal territory, whether it's a child in Sri Lanka or a soldier in Afghanistan. Right. Uh, he was really brilliant at it. And I think we have to take another break already. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I think that that is sort of the fundamental essence of what there should be more of in the world. You know, I, I think we need, obviously, we need the hardcore journalism that's going to sort of um, make the political situation, wherever we are, very transparent, because I think that needs to happen, which is a definite conversation I'd like to have with you. Um, and, and just being able to find, it's almost like that simple breath. You know, we, we, we're, we're so overwhelmed with all this chaos, and, and, and I feel like there's just an outburst of violence and, and unrest really everywhere in the world right now. And there's no real responsibility coming from our leaders or the, whoever is, is governing in any country right now. I think there's a very small amount of responsibility being taken. And uh, so to be able to tap into that sort of innocence, that, and I say innocence just because it's, it's so simple. It's just yeah. basic humanity, you know, and, and it is lovely to strip away and just sort of talk to the person and hear, you know, this is the everyday stuff that gets lost sometimes. Well, Tim, um, Tim and I both, actually, the way we understood our jobs is that we were trying to understand the human cost of war. Mm. And that doesn't just mean what the Afghans were experiencing. It also means what the American soldiers were experiencing. I mean, we're all humans. We're all having an experience, and one that's important, and one in which we are subject to forces that are way more powerful than we can control. And that's true of everybody. Right. And it's even true of journalists in war zones. And that was um, that was the way we kind of focused our work. What's the, what's what are the emotional consequences of all this? And I have to say, like. I mean, the first war I covered was Bosnia, after that was Kosovo, Sierra Leone, Liberia. Every single war I've ever covered was ended by, not by talking, but by military action, military intervention, by the use of armed force, a superior armed force, to stop the warring sides from fighting. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and Tim and I, both, you could hardly call us pacifists. I mean, if there's a war going on, in another part of the world, uh, uh, you know, it's amazing how fast a NATO airstrike can bring it to a stop. And <laughs> sometimes that's the best thing. And so, right. Tim and I were not at all sort of like anti military because well, we no, saw how the be. military can actually save lives. Yeah. Um, but that puts us in a very complicated position with, in a discussion with liberal minded people. And I'm politically completely liberal, but. That my understanding of war gets kind of complicated in that kind of conversation. Right. No, I I definitely can. You know, I'm gonna we're gonna have to take another break on that note. But I yeah. I would kind of like to lead lead into that and as soon as uh, we take our little two minute break, and I will be I'm gonna try and get you off um, the hold. <laughs> so just give me one oh, second. Oh. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Sebastian. Thanks for tuning in once again. This is your host Don Garcia. A Todd Radio, bring life one moment at a time. Hi, I'm Aaron Michael Sanchez. And I'm Kelly B. Dolan. And we are excited to announce our show live with Aaron Kelly is on Rant Radio Network. What do we talk about on our show, Kelly? We talk about everything from entertainment to business and tech. And we have a few laughs in between. <laughs> That's right. Go check us out on RantRadioNetwork.com. That's RantRadioNetwork.com. Check it out. We are the three guys every Monday live from 6 to 7 p.m. You can call us at 855-69-THE-THREE-GUYS. <laughs> it's not the three guys. This is why you should turn in because one has Tourette's, 
The you other really, one's illiterate. You really should listen, and you never know what's going to happen. 855 69 guys G-U-Y-S, and the number three, not the. Faces yeah. for radio, voices for the deaf. Look forward to talking to you. Hey, I'm audio candy. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> This segment has been brought to you by Coco Cafe. It's a cafe latte coconut water with espresso. And I came across this wonderful little drink just recently. And it has to be one of the best things I've ever had. I'm pretty obsessed with cocoa water and espresso. So the thought of it together was a little bit, I'm not, I wasn't sure what I was going to get. But my gosh, let me tell you, it's super tasty. It's made with natural coconut water, a strong shot of espresso, and a splash of reduced fat milk. You can visit them online for more information at drinkcococafe.com. Once again, I want to thank everyone at Coco Cafe for being a sponsor of this radio show. Thanks so much. This is Anthony Sykes, your host for Sykes Accounting and Consulting Radio Show, where we help small businesses grow and give you tax tips every Tuesday from 6 to 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Catch us here on RantRadioNetwork.com. Thank you. Hi everyone, this is The Taste of Dawn. I'm your host, Dawn Garcia, and this is a show about indulging in this crazy thing we call life. All right, I think we're back on. Oh, I don't have him. Here we go. Are you there? There you I'm go. here. There you go. Okay, technical difficulties. Um, so yes, okay, so what we were talking about actually just off off the air I think is a really really good topic that we should discuss so um, the whole concept of whether or not the military presence in these countries is well received or necessary um, I think that's always a, a an interesting like subject to tackle really and yeah. you know just trying to figure out too like what's the right course of action in general and on a humanitarian side you don't want suffer you don't want anybody to be under any kind of dictatorship or you know oppressive rule and then but then when is the right time to go in and I think we had talked about this as well as it's so frustrating sometimes because it seems at least on the surface that war is the first course of action rather than the last course of action well I'm not sure that's true I mean in Bosnia they the you know European politicians talked and negotiated and threatened and cajoled for four years Right. Uh, and 200,000 Bosnians were killed before, you know, 10 days of NATO bombing runs that, that ended the war. Mm. And, you know, like, you know, Rwanda, like, they, no one ever did anything and, yeah, and they, is, except talk. Which and, is still the biggest. And a lot of people died. So, I, I, you know, even in, I mean, I was not a fan of the Bush administration, and I was completely, completely against the Iraq war, utterly. Yes. Yeah. But, but with Afghanistan, it was really interesting, and people forget this, um... I mean, I think George Bush, the last thing, seriously, that I think he wanted to do was go into Afghanistan. I think he had his eyes set on Iraq, and Afghanistan really was kind of a, a tangent that he didn't want to deal with. Right. But he told the Taliban that we'd been attacked, and that the people who attacked us were hosts, were guests in their country, and if they handed al-Qaeda over, the al-Qaeda leadership over, that the U.S. would come in and, and help Afghanistan rebuild and if they didn't hand them over, we would come in and get them. And it was really the Taliban who chose war. I mean, they they were the ones who chose not to hand them over. Right. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think it's actually a little more complicated than you just said. Well, <laughs> it always is. I just, <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, well, I mean, Iraq, I think most people would agree was, at least on the surface, I think everybody wanted to believe it began for the right reasons, but it really should have started somewhere else if it was going to have to start anywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now, of course, uh, in Afghanistan, I, I had a friend of mine had made a documentary actually, um, just about how how beautiful of a country Afghanistan actually was before war, and how much it had to offer culturally, and that women actually had a voice, and you know, and then all of a sudden, all these changes happened, and all the civil unrest happened, and then of course the war breaks out, and the Taliban regime takes over, and you know, now we're left with this sort of broken country that. I don't know how long it will take, really, to to bring it back to a point where people do have more freedoms again, and 
you know, even though there's been tremendous change, um, and I guess that could lead us maybe to the Arab Spring discussion, but um, I think in general, I don't know. Like, I'm just, I think the wars, it needs to happen. I mean, I'm not an advocate of, of war per se, but I do also think that there are causes that are just too unjust that can't be ignored. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, the so- I mean, Afghanistan was more or less okay for that part of the world until the Soviets rolled in there in 70, late 79. And when they pulled out, the country collapsed into civil war using weapons that we had pumped in there uh, because they were our proxies in the Cold War. And then the civil war, which was very, very costly uh, in terms of lives, mm-hmm. uh, that civil war ended on 9-11, basically. And so right now, because of NATO's forces in Afghanistan, this is now the lowest level of civilian casualties in that country in 30 years. And when we pull out, which we are, un- undoubtedly the civilian casualties will go up. Wow. And yeah, so that no makes policing. it very complicated to calculate what would be a proper sort of peaceful course of action, because withdrawing soldiers usually ends the war. In this case, it will probably escalate it. Yeah, see, that's, I can't imagine. I, I just, I think that that's such a bad situation in general. Like, I really wish that there was a clearer and more concise way yeah. of fixing that problem. I think everybody probably agrees. But um, yeah. I think that that's just gotten so complicated. It's so, yeah. so complicated. And it's, you know, it's not, obviously, it's not the same as the Gaza Strip situation, but it sort of has the potential to be a back and forth. Yeah. You know, which well, the pro- you know, the problem, really, in my mind, is that uh, George Bush didn't go to war enough, actually. I mean, I, I was there after 9-11 when the Taliban were overrun in Kabul, and, uh, I mean, people would come up to me on the street and hug me when they found out that I was American mm-hmm. because they felt that we had freed them from the tyranny of the Taliban. Wow. And uh, that, you know, he, he, what, he, what Bush did was that he left something like ten or 15,000 troops there and then moved on to Iraq. And had he actually put a proper force in place, had he devoted the kind of money and energy and manpower that he put into into Baghdad, had he put that into Afghanistan, I don't think there'd be a war there right now. But he kind of did it light, and that's why it's still going on. It's a real shame. It cost a lot of lives. Yeah, well, that's uh, politics with a little undercut of personal... (laughs) Yeah. Um, So... Okay, so then we can actually go from this discussion to, I, I want to know, like, what is your next assignment? Do you know? Well, after Tim got killed, uh, I decided literally within hours that uh, I wouldn't do any more war reporting. I wasn't going to risk my life in that way. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I've been very busy making this film about Tim and some other things. Uh, I haven't been on assignment, on a proper assignment in a long time. And I'm not sure quite when or where the next one will be, but it will not be a frontline yeah. combat zone. I'm sure your family actually appreciates that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. in that, and I know Tim's death actually led you to creating risk training. So if, if we can touch a little bit on that really quick, I'd love to tell everybody what you're doing there because I think it's really, really, really necessary for field yeah, journalists. Tim, Tim died uh, of a shrapnel wound. He, he did- he just bled out. He just died of loss of blood. And no one around him, the other journalists, uh, no one around him knew what to do to to help him. And he died minutes from a hospital. He just, they just didn't get him there in time. And so I started a, a training program for freelance war reporters because none of us know anything about medicine, about battlefield medicine, and me included. And mm-hmm. so I started a freelance training program called Reporters Instructed in Saving Colleagues. R-I-S-C, Risk. Uh, the website is risktraining.org. Uh, and the three-day training course in New York is completely free. The hotel is free. The medical kit is free. And it's a three-day intensive course for 24 seasoned freelance war reporters at a time to train them in life-saving techniques on the battlefield. We do three courses a year, and we completely depend on donations. So just a real quick um mention to any airlines out there that want to make the flights free for these guys go ahead and <laughs> oh fantastic right okay. and i did talk to lily actually and i'm gonna work with her to try and create some kind of event to do some fundraising for the organization here in los angeles great fantastic so, i really appreciate that. yeah because i i think that is it is sort of like that untapped 
part of you know these people putting their you guys not really these people you and your colleagues just putting their lives on the line every time they go out there and not being properly prepared in the event that they're left somewhere and they don't have what they need so i think i think it's exceptionally admirable that now there's at least something like this for everybody that's going to go out and risk their lives um yeah And two, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about, I have a whole list of things, (laughs) but, um, so are you going to be working on any books or anything anytime soon? Do you think? Have you started? Yeah, I I, I am starting in another book and I, uh, it's, uh, uh, subject matter is within the U S and I actually can't tell you what it is because it's somewhat, uh, sketchy and uh, secret. <laughs> okay. <laughs> DEFCOM 5, I got it. Um, but yeah, so, well, welcome to the United States political system, um, which is, I'm sure there are so many things to talk about in this country, yeah. uh, where I don't think we're unfortunately ever at a shortage of topics that lead to a lot of questioning. Um, okay, so we can't talk about that. So, um, and you, I know you're in a a faraway place right now, so I just wanted to say thanks for even coming on here and talking to me while you're oh, taking, my pleasure. My taking pleasure. a break from life. Um, so now, we were talking a little bit. What, what is your take kind of on the Arab Spring? That's immersive. It's my, my take on the Arab Spring, I, I mean, I think if you um, all these countries that are erupting right now, some more violently than others, uh, they were all countries that were that suffered through decades of very very oppressive uh, political systems, governments, mm-hmm. and, and often governments dictators supported by the United States for our own reasons. And I think you really, you, I think you can't oppress people for that long without there being a violent reaction. Right. Well, and um, I think the violence is in proportion to the level of oppression. And Syria was. Unbelievably oppressive and violent. Uh, the Assad government regime was unbelievably oppressive and violent, and so you have an incredibly violent civil war. Tunisia was on the other end of the spectrum, mm. and they changed their political system, and there was some violence, but it was pretty minimal. So it's basically you get what you pay for, and we've been paying into uh, oppression in some ways for many decades. This country has, yes. and now we're watching the results. Yeah, I think it's it's unfortunate because what you end up finding out is all of these countries who are under such regimes somehow our hand is in it, which is very frustrating. Yeah. Um, and I so I guess that we could kind of touch on the Syria situation. So, do you think that that is our next place that we will end up? Like, uh, you- I mean, I've never been. I'm, I haven't worked in Syria, but. Uh, no, I, I mean, I'm Not just taking personally. a guess here, but I, I don't think we're going to wind up on the ground in Syria, no. Okay, I hope not. When, and, <laughs> when you know, less... we didn't wind up on the ground in Libya either. I mean, we. Right. I think we did something absolutely crucial in defending Benghazi with, with airstrikes. Uh, and I think we saved, I think NATO saved a lot of lives, but we were not on the ground there uh, with the with the very brief exception of a fighter pilot who had to ditch his plane and was rescued by special forces. So now I was reading a little bit about the Muslim Brotherhood as well and how they're trying to push through a different constitu- a new constitution that has some of that old, um, more oppressive language in it. And I'm very curious to see if that... It, it, just, it was posted on the 4th, actually, so it might have changed, but um, it was done by Kenneth Roth, actually wrote the article. Um, yeah. have, so I have you. I, I don't really know anything about that particular. Like I just can't keep up. I feel like there's so much news. Um, but yeah, I, I'm curious to see. How, do you think that that's that that's another threat? To- well, I, I mean, Egypt is a Muslim country, right. and so the Muslim Brotherhood is going to have a voice. You yeah. know, um, I, I remember in the 80s, there was an organization in this country called the Moral Majority. Mm-hmm. They had a very strong political voice because we're a, quote, Christian country. And, I, I, you know, I think what you're seeing in both, both in terms of uh, Christ, Christian influences in American politics and Muslim influences in Middle Eastern politics, I think you're seeing the um, really incorrect and, and uh, unfortunate influence of religion in government and I, I think it should stop on both sides and it's really problematic 
It really is, actually. I think that we are just on our own accord. I, I feel like it's time for us to sort of have a, a peaceful revolution, and, and there's got to be a bigger way to have a voice in, against that infiltration because I really do feel like the religious lines are being very blurred and the religious and political lines are becoming all too much the same, especially with yeah. the extremist mentality that's sort of taking over. Yeah. And um, I mean, I I can't believe that we still have issues with things like gay marriage. I'm like, really? We go to war, you know, <laughs> there's, there's yeah. gotta be a bigger issue here at hand. Um, yeah. I know. Do we have to take a break already? No. Okay. We have another minute before we have to take another break, but yeah, I, I'm actually very curious to see what's going to happen there because I think our like just just whoever is in Congress right now and the things that are being passed, there there should be, I think, a four-party system now. I feel like the two-party system is failing us. I think we're, we're getting too much on the extremist sides on both sides of the fence, yeah. and there is no real moderate voice anymore. And that was the that was at one point. You know, the well, beauty is you could find a moderate that was a true moderate. Well, you know, I, I actually think that the Democratic Party is fairly moderate. The the extreme left has almost no voice in American politics. They're pretty much ignored. I think what's really unfortunate. And I'm a Democrat, but I think what's I, we need, you know the Democrats need a, a, a strong Republican Party and to work against and work with. Yes. And I think what's really unfortunate is the Republican Party is just tearing itself apart. And, it really uh, is. And it's unraveling. On the unraveling. one hand, it's kind of amusing to watch. On the other hand, it's pretty mortifying. It is. I just think that it's, it's shooting itself in the foot on a regular basis. Yeah. Because I think there's even, like, true... There are true conservatives who are just appalled by some of the yeah. things that are happening in our, in, our, in our government right now. And it's, to me, from everything from how things are handled fiscally to handled... Uh, on social, you know, on a, on a very simple social level, yeah. you can see such a just massive influx of a religious. There's like this, you know, this undertone of this religious extremist, and it is coming from more so, obviously, the Republican Party. Um, yeah. And I don't understand how it's gotten so far without being checked. I mean, I well, once upon it, a time, I mean, it used it, to have people used to fight a little bit harder for that, you know? It's the same thing that the Democrats did to themselves in the 80s. I mean, they really hamstrung yeah, themselves true. by being kind of ha you know, handcuffed to the far left, and it made them politically completely impotent. Mm -hmm. And now the Republicans have done that with the far right, and I, I hopefully they'll mature and grow out of it, uh, because I they're useless so. to themselves, and I, I just don't think they're helping the country much right now. No, it's in it, there's there are some really really powerful voices on that on the Republican side that could be making such a big difference if their voices were heard and not so stifled. Yeah. You know, and that's the yeah. unfortunate side is there are there are just too many loud voices that are sort of taking over and not yeah. you know, and we're losing sight. That's the one thing I wish way more that would happen and, and it just doesn't seem to be happening enough is that I think we're forgetting or the government, at least in place, on both sides of the spectrum, sometimes they're forgetting who they govern, that they were put yeah. there, that it's a privilege. It's not... Sometimes it feels a little dictatorial, you know? And yeah. and I wonder... You know, just... I'm hoping that things will change. I mean, I, I wasn't entirely impressed with the first four years of Obama. I felt it was a little quiet. But, um, I'm you know, when he gave his speech at the inauguration... I think everybody felt a little bit more encouraged that maybe the second set, you know, second set, <laughs> but the next yeah. four years, he'll actually have an opportunity to really do something a little bit more um, impacting that might turn things around. I mean, and the sad part is, right, is everybody thinks it's not what, you know, nobody just gets to take over and they don't inherit, they inherit 20 years, if not more of just crap, you know, and right. it's, it's <laughs> super difficult to try and change that in the course of a year or two or four. Um, yeah, but I, I'm I'm hoping I'm really hopeful that our system becomes a little less transparent in terms of the religious influence. I really, I think it's so anti-constitutional, you know. Just well, you know, apparently twenty percent of the country is not affiliated with any religion. So uh, hopefully, the Republicans will realize that the political future is in rational dialogue that does not include a strong religious agenda. Right. It, it would be great. Wouldn't it be great? Yeah. That's my hope, too. So um, we are actually about to wrap up. So I want to just say really quick that um, for all of you guys listening, uh, Sebastian's new film, um, Which Way From Here to the Front Line, The Life and Time of Tim Hetherington, will be 
Did I say that right? Which way is the front line? Uh, from here? Way, which which way is the front line from here? Yeah, I keep getting that That's one. Right. <laughs> it's just the first thing Kim says in the film and uh, uh, in Misrata. So yeah. And it premieres um, on April eighteenth on HBO. So please make sure you guys watch. It's going to be uh, an amazing film. I'm have I have no doubts. It's going to be just. I can't wait. I can't. I mean, just the Thank clips alone. You. Yeah, and um, and congratulations to you on just everything that you've accomplished. And and I'm glad you're not going to be putting yourself in danger for at least a little while. We we Thank you very we much. need your voice. <laughs> so Thank you. Um, Thank you. yeah, and then also um, I'm going to make sure that I post and let everybody know about risk. And on my website, if you guys go to a Todd Magazine, you can click on the links and donate. Please do. It's um, R I S C. Is it risktraining.org? Risktrading dot org r i s c yeah risk trading okay so please go and donate and just just it's a worthy cause um and thank you again Sebastian so much for being on the show I wish I could probably talk to you for another five hours so <laughs> thank um, you yeah you're welcome and have a really good rest of your day and enjoy your break all right thank you very much you're so welcome thanks have a great night yeah okay are you care. night I don't know if you're in night I don't know where you are but wherever you are oh I'm I'm, I'm on the east coast so oh okay well so have a good yeah. afternoon okay <laughs> thank you all right thanks thank- again. Yeah. All bye. right. Bye bye. All right, you guys. So that was for me one of the best episodes yet. I'm just so grateful that I got an opportunity to talk to Sebastian and just to give you guys some information um, on maybe topics that you've never really looked into in terms of really what's happening around the world politically, socially, um, and and I think that discussion actually of how religion has found its way into our system a little bit too. Yeah, you can actually pull back a little bit. Sorry. Um, just, I think that that's a good discussion to have. And I know I don't typically talk about politics, but I do think that it's a very important conversation. So I'm open to having that conversation whenever you are up for it. Um, I do want to say, though, with the last five minutes that I have, I want to completely switch gears and let you know that on Thursday, I have another musical guest coming in to perform, and I'm really excited about them. It's Sadie and the Blue-Eyed Devils, and they are very fun, um, kind of that old school, um, I don't want to say, I don't even know if you could really qualify the era, but they play with washboards and banjos, and she's got a harmonica attached to her, and her voice is absolutely angelic. So, um, really looking forward to that. We're going to go back in time just a little bit. And you can look them up on uh, Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Sadie and the Blue Eyed Devils. And that's S-A-D-I-E. Um, please make sure that you go like the page actually for Sebastian's new movie. Um, just look it up on Facebook. And it is Which Way is the Front Line from Here? And I think that that is the name of the page. And then the additional, The Life and Time of Tim Hetherington is just a part of it. So please type that in. Again, I would encourage you to go just research, you know, what journalists go through and the the lives that they put. They really put themselves in harm's way to make sure that we get a story to discover the truth, whether they're, like he said, I mean, they could be unearthing the simple human essentials of who we are and, and the impacts of war to people that are not, in the military and then of course the flip side of that is the political repercussions of what happens to people who have gone to war and um had to come back and you know I I think no matter where you are in the world and what you're doing I mean I'm a bleeding heart hippie I think in that respect that I really wish that we did not have to resort to violence to to have some kind of peace in this world and I know that that's a kumbaya sort of mentality but I'm going to still be a big dreamer and hope that maybe one day we could just talk it out and uh, doesn't matter if it's a heated discussion but I do think that there's something to be said for some diplomacy Um, on another note what else do I want to talk about I got to go by the way what am I saying what do I want to talk about Uh, I'm hoping if you are listening executive producer of the latest Roman Coppola film we need to get Charlie Sheen on here so that is on the table for a discussion and I would love to have him on the air and just I think um, after seeing the premiere last night which is inside the glimpse or a, a glimpse inside the mind of Charles Swan the third I went to the premiere last night and Got to briefly speak with Roman Coppola and Jason Schwartzman. Um, and there was a, just a lot of really cool people there last night. And um, if you get a chance to see the movie, it's a whole nother side of Charlie, actually. It was the first time I think it was so honest and real. And I know everybody, unfortunately, watched way too much on YouTube. Um, but he is 
he's really endearing in this movie. So if you get a chance, please, please, please see it the moment it comes out. It's it's well worth it. Um, Jason, Jason Schwartzman is hysterical. Patricia Arquette is brilliant in it. Um, and Bill Murray, of course, is Bill Murray. But there are some really touching moments in that film that I really wasn't prepared for. And it's odd and crazy and wild and um, true Roman Coppola style. But it really is a... a a wonderful little piece of, of cinema so I, I was pleasantly surprised and of course it's based on my friend Charles White the third so um, go visit the new issue of course atodmagazine.com and look under issue number one and you'll see Charles White and please read about him he is a fascinating gentleman who has contributed so much to the world of art and just kind of the way we see things in in a pop cultural way and especially when it comes to creating um I know we're running out of time here. What else do I want to mention? Um, let's see, Alexis, do what I have. That's it. She's like looking at me like, why do you just put me on the spot? Um, so anyways, yeah, I, I'm, my brain is just processing everything that I just talked about. So, um, yeah, thank you guys so much for just sticking with me and, and allowing me to show you so many different sides of me and my personality and the things that make me feel like this world is a beautiful place so uh, that wraps it up don't forget to tune in again on Thursday I have Sadie and the Blue Eyed Devils in and you are not going to want to miss that so have a really good afternoon talk to you guys on Thursday thanks for tuning in once again this is your host Don Garcia on A Todd Radio savoring life one moment at a time Welcome, everybody. I'm Dawn Garcia of A Todd Magazine, and this is my brand new show, A Taste of Dawn, where we'll talk about everything related to savoring life. You can catch me on rantradionetwork.com every Tuesday and Thursday from noon to one, where we're going to discuss food and wine, arts and entertainment, music, travel, leisure, and anything in between. <laughs>